We, the Center for Global Development, we're a group that try and see how we can make the international system that supports global development work more effectively. How do we finance infrastructure in the poorest parts of the world? How do we increase productivity in agriculture? What kind of policy brings out the best outcomes? What CGD is about is you can ask those difficult questions that people refuse to ask and actually find solutions. We're thinking about how climate change will impact migration patterns, how that will in turn have impacts on people's health. It's challenging to be able to align budget with ambitious programmatic goals, but it can be done. If you can help to make things a little bit better, that's a good way to spend your time. Okay, good morning and welcome to the Center for Global Development. Welcome to this conversation. I'm really excited about this. Uh, today we have uh, two eminent uh, people who are going to have a conversation about a topic that is really important and very timely. We have uh, Ajay Banka, the uh, sole nominee to be the next president of the World Bank Group. and. Uh, comes to this uh, role with a very stellar career in the private sector, but also comes to this role at a time when expectations of what the next president uh, will do to uh, help the World Bank Group move to take on new challenges, uh, as well as uh, continuing with its traditional role, are very high. And so, uh, Ajay, welcome to, to CGD. and. Uh, and we're very much looking forward to this being the first of uh, uh, many opportunities to interact with you. And in conversation with Ajay is uh, Afsane Beshloss. Uh, Afsane Beshloss, of course, is herself a former senior official at the World Bank, uh, uh, but also founder and CEO of, the, of Rock Creek, uh, a, a global investment firm. And uh, perhaps most importantly, I should say, a board member of CGD and a, uh, a long-term friend, uh, personal friend. So thank you very much, Afsane, for also joining us. So the plan for today in the, in the time we have, the short time we have, is that I'm going to invite Ajay to come to the podium, make a few opening remarks. He's been on a listening tour or, uh, since his nomination. and. And no doubt he's picked up lots of ideas. Probably some of them go in completely opposite direction from other ideas he's picked up. So it'd be interesting to see what his vision is now. And then Ajay and Afsane will have a conversation. So I'm looking forward to that. Join me first in welcoming Ajay to, to the podium. So I gotta get my glasses out. But Masood, thank you very much for having me here. And Afsane, I've got about 48 minutes of remarks, so that'll give us about a minute or two to have a chat, right? That's a smart way to do this. A good interactive conversation. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, so uh, in the last four weeks, that's correct, I have been uh, to eight countries, four continents. I met government officials from about 40 different countries. I met uh, civil society stakeholders, I met business leaders, I met experts in, in climate, I met experts in development, I met experts in finance. As you can imagine, I had a lot of advice. Right? There's no end to thoughts of what people expect from the World Bank in today's uh, situation. Most importantly, I also got a chance to see firsthand a few real projects that the World Bank has been involved in uh, both in Kenya and in Cote d'Ivoire, which I found the most fascinating because I could see the impact, not just the dollar's length, but the result of that with the people in the field. But the thing is, there's some very important conversations that I've not yet had, and that is with the people of the World Bank. I think their work very often goes unsung, as does the work of people in so many institutions represented here. And so take everything I say with that little context that I haven't had a chance to meet the people who do the work. And when I get that, then hopefully I'll be a little more informed. That's the team I hope to join and lead at a time when I think our challenges are very complex. And I am deeply concerned about what I am seeing. I was concerned earlier. This four to six week period has made me more concerned. I know a number of you share that concern. 
I think the scale and diversity of our challenges, the pandemic, climate change, conflict, fragility, basically everything to do with inequality in all its dimensions. Kind of what we set out to do when we talked about reducing poverty and, and sort of sharing prosperity. But guess what? These things are intertwined and they threaten our collective ambition. So we're seeing decades of very hard-won progress getting turned back in a very short period of time. There's an unnecessary war in Ukraine. It's not only destroying lives and cities in that country, it is causing pain for people in faraway towns and on distant farms. The impacts of climate change that drive severe drought in one part of the world. I was in Kenya, they hadn't had rain for four years. Intense storms in another, and in general, they threaten our way of life and the way of life for our children and our grandchildren. The lack of access to good schools, decent health care, reliable infrastructure. And in infrastructure, I want to make sure you know that I'm talking about not just physical, but also very importantly, digital infrastructure. This locks entire communities in a cycle of poverty. So the aspirations of people around the world, those are universal. They all want jobs and quality of life. But we live in a world of greater polarization and extremes. Countries are facing this diverse sets of challenges. They're experiencing them differently. And that's the landscape in which the World Bank is operating. It has to pursue both climate adaptation and mitigation. It has to reach out to lower income countries and not turn its back on middle income countries. It has to think globally, but recognize national and regional needs. That task is great. We have an abundance of challenges, a scarcity of time. We have to get, in the case of climate change, to halve emissions by 2030, that's seven years, reach net zero by 2050. Fortunately, the World Bank was designed to do hard things. Born of war, forged as an institution of peace. The World Bank has a proven capacity to rise and to meet great challenges. That's why we need a World Bank an institution that delivers quality assistance in all its forms. Knowledge, capacity building, policy dialogue, and yes, finance, but not only finance. In a way that is timely, effective, and adheres to the highest standards that we would all like it to be. Now, what does that mean in practice? First, it means providing the dignity of work to all people particularly young people and women, who should be not only encouraged, but again, note this word, empowered, to reach for any opportunity that they desire. And of course, it means expanding quality of life. We all know that the surest way to reduce poverty and spread prosperity is through employment. In fact, most of the gains that we have celebrated in reducing poverty over the last few decades have come from exactly those places where employment has risen steadily as millions of jobs were created, lifting incomes, lifting outcomes, and lifting resources. But it's more than numbers, because actually with a job comes dignity, comes pride, comes the ability to provide for yourself and for your family. Without a job, or even worse, the hope of one, people turn to despair, and then they will grasp for any hand that offers a way out. So most important for poverty reduction and growing prosperity is to get people a job, to create opportunities for them to have that sense of dignity and pride. You also want to help them raise their quality of life. That's the second comment I got, which spans the full spectrum of the development agenda, the climate agenda, the fragility agenda, the equality agenda, clean air, clean water, access to education, healthcare, financial inclusion, all those. All are parts of the same shared goal, and they are the foundation for everything else that we aspire to achieve. Many are helped if we can better harness and expand the transformative power of digital technology. Digitization enables and advances our goals. It offers us the opportunity to shift the landscape and level the playing field. And just by virtue of that, those who are often excluded are now included. We lift up women and girls, we pull in the poor, and we reach out to the rural. The system is made wider with digital technology. Suddenly, there's a classroom in everybody's pocket. Let's not forget the COVID experience. That is right now, it just happened. 
And yes, a lot happened not the best way on education at that time, but imagine education situation over the last three years without this tool of digitization. The doctor's not a day away, they're a button away. The best information on crop yields, planting times, even fair prices is not just for large farms, it is for all farms. And the system is not just wider, it's cleaner. It removes grease from the palm and sticky fingers from getting their hands on the money that we try to get to people. A digital system is more transparent. It builds in accountability and therefore it is the key facilitator of good governance. I saw this myself in my years in MasterCard when we made the effort to reach 500 million people for financial inclusion. Without digitization, there was not any hope that we could have got there. Not only did we get there, my successor has got more bold and has committed to reach a billion people by 2025. He could not have done that without digitization. And this is all within reach in today's world. Digitization is here. IDA is already a critical development finance tool for the most in need. Lower income countries will continue to struggle with these quality of life challenges unless we deploy IDA to its fullest. But maintaining levels of funding, meeting that need, this is going to be a challenge. And our aspiration will place enormous importance on a well-resourced IDA and require us all to do our part. So second, the World Bank should lead the way. We can, we, I hope to be we, and must play a central role to coordinate global action. We've got to work in tandem with all multilateral development banks and institutions so we maximize the impact. I see the bank as a catalyst for change across development institutions. We should set the tone and the pace, motivate peer organizations with our energy, our creativity, our risk-taking, our results. That is a critical part of our role. Third, the World Bank should continue to grow as a knowledge bank. Even more than its balance sheet, I think our greatest asset is the people, the experience, the hard-earned lessons that have come from 80 years, or close to 80 years, of working on the front lines of development. Like the bank, that knowledge belongs to the world and should be shared for the benefit of all to build capacity, to develop policy capabilities, to help countries with governance, and transfer the lessons that facilitate success. Fourth, we must leverage resources efficiently and effectively. So this is where all the conversation has been for the last few months, right? The G20 Capital Adequacy Framework contains many recommendations that we can put to work immediately. The idea is we've got to squeeze everything from what we possibly can from what we have now. There's nothing wrong with that idea. It's a sensible thing to do. And from what I have heard, the current plan would generate as much as $5 billion a year, which, by the way, in context, something I learned earlier today, the last time we went through a capital increase where shareholders had to put in money, we generated six, six and a half billion. Without putting in money, if we're able to generate $5 billion with only the first set of steps, with more to come, that's good. We should do it. Now, maybe we can get a little more, or even a lot more, with the next set of steps. Whatever the amount may be, we have to put our balance sheet to work. However, after we do all this and we demonstrate results, this is not going to be enough. Because all estimates today point to trillions. And I, you know, trillions are fancy numbers, but they don't point to billions. So there's a little bit of a gap. There's a bid ask issue. For infrastructure, for climate, for inequality. The math is not on our side. And the World Bank cannot do this alone. Even the generosity of governments, of philanthropies, the work of the other multilateral banks, together, we're going to fall short of those trillions. We will need the private sector to come into this journey. We're going to have to have everybody working in tandem, all our shoulders to the wheel. And I think the World Bank can play a central role in this effort by using its resources and its policy know-how to more effectively catalyze private capital, but also not just international private capital, but domestic resources have got to be developed. We know we need to get the private sector to be a constructive player in this mission, but wishing it is not going to get the job done. Our job is to figure out what holds them back and find ways to make it work. They won't come in 
when there are risks they don't understand or a landscape they don't get. They have to take risk. That's why they make a reward. But they have to understand the risk and put it within the context of their return on capital. So we take this simple example of electricity from renewables. The technology and business model has evolved to where we can see the private sector beginning to invest because over time that risk has diminished, the risk they didn't understand. And possibility has grown in its place. The question is, can we reduce or remove risk for the private sector so we can get to real scale? We just have to move past pilots. Pilots are not going to get us to 2030 and 2050. And just some examples. Could the World Bank take a first loss position? Don't, please don't take these as solutions, just examples. Or could we scale the use of MEGA? Or at pre-operation stage, could we take projects with long gestation periods onto IFC's balance sheet and then put them back onto the private sector when they're operational, freeing up our capital at that time, but de-risking for the private sector in the early stages? Can we create standardized pools of assets that long duration investors, pension funds, asset managers can invest in at scale? so on and so forth. They have to get creative. But it's not just financial engineering that is needed. The World Bank, with its knowledge and global footprint, should help countries develop clear and ambitious plans for carbon reduction. What do I mean by that? Transition plans, consistent governance frameworks, sound policies and regulations. What that does is introduce a level of stability, certainty and long-term vision which kind of allows the private sector to feel that they can invest in that country. And the countries that have done this well get more investment. It's not a coincidence. Even though they may be difficult environments to operate in. If you can do this in concert with the other multilateral banks, I believe we can deliver even more. It's not easy. It's not going to get done in 100 days. Please. You guys need to manage the expectations for me. You will actually make me a failure even with my best intentions and with the best people. This idea that somehow, you know, the white knight with the magic wand has arrived, please don't do that. I'm going to need a lot of help and effort to make this happen. I know this firsthand from my experience building public-private coalitions through the Partnership for Central America. Don't get me wrong, I'm ambitious, you will see here. We helped raise more than $4 billion of commitments in under two years to invest in those countries so that people don't feel the pressure to migrate, enduring a gauntlet of danger along the journey just to find a better life. The partnership's goal is to generate a million jobs in Central America in the coming years. I don't know if a million is the right number. Maybe five is the right number, just as I didn't know that 500 million for financial inclusion was the right number in the spring meetings of the IMF and the World Bank in 2014, when on a stage I just made that commitment and then walked off the stage to find my MasterCard colleagues ready to shoot me. <laughs> right? But we got there. So my point to you is, don't get me wrong about the ambition. I just want to have the right process to get there. We will do everything we can to maximize the capital adequacy framework. Note that. We will get creative to improve the operating model. We will work to force multiply. We will share knowledge. We will do everything in our power to recruit the private sector. Those demands are great. But each of us, bank management, staff, stakeholders, many of you in this room, and the shareholders, also in this room, some of them, we all must be ready for what that objective requires. For the people in the bank, it means listening carefully to all involved, as I have been doing over the last few weeks, and hopefully I will continue to do that the right way, but then acting with a sense of urgency. Listen, but then move on with a sense of urgency. Thoughtful risk-taking, because you will never have perfect information. And then being empowered, but also being accountable for results. Not for dollars lent, but for private sector money mobilized, for girls sent to school, for skilled workers who land a job. That should be our yardstick of accountability. For stakeholders, civil society, scholars, and the business community, it means getting greater transparency into what the bank achieves, focusing on the impact, not the process, the outcome, not the input. And for the leadership, it means celebrating success, but also accepting and learning from failure. It means providing clarity of vision, transparency of evaluation, identifying and measuring the outcome expectations, offering peace of mind to staff that thoughtful risk-taking is okay and failing is okay 
because we won't win the fight ahead of us without taking some risks. The trick is, don't make the same mistake twice. That is important. You make the same mistake twice, you should go work somewhere else. But if you're willing to take the risk, then you shouldn't feel that that's the end of your career or your life. Otherwise, these challenges we are talking about, we can forget about getting them sorted out by 2030 and 2050. Business as usual is not going to change the world for my grandchild. So that's the point. So, but we're going to do it by cultivating a respectful workplace built around diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. That is non-negotiable in my world and in everybody else's world. In my view, that's how we'll drive change together. Change is appropriate for the World Bank. It isn't a symptom of failure or drift or irrelevance. It is a symptom of opportunity of life and importance. In 1945, President Roosevelt wrote to the United States Congress, I do not want to leave with you the impression that these proposals for the fund and the bank are perfect in every detail. It may well be that the experience of future years will show us how they can be improved. That is our charge, evolving the World Bank to tackle intertwined global challenges that its founders could not have foreseen. So then why am I optimistic about our chances? Because in all corners of the globe, people are eager to go to work. They want to create with their own hands. They want a better life for their children and grandchildren. They want jobs. They want quality of life. That is the aspiration of young people. Their optimism, their creativity is infectious and energy that the global south has in abundance. Our task is to open the door to the opportunities that they need to succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, man. That was amazing. That was amazing. That sense of dynamic spirit that you bring is really so needed. And I'm so, so excited to be here today with you, Ajay. And as uh, Masood said, um, we're very grateful to you for joining us here at CGD with uh, the audience here and the audience who's watching us and sharing your vision for the World Bank and the urgent problems that it, um, it uh, is facing right now. As Masood said, a number of people here, including myself, have been part of the discussions mm -hmm. at CGD. And some of us have even worked there and uh, care for the institution. And I think the way you spoke felt like you had been working there as well already. So. <laughs> for whatever that's worth or <laughs> not. Yeah. Um, I had a few questions, although I have to tell you, you did, in a very short time, cover a lot of the ground that I was going to ask you. So, so I should have kept going for 44 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> exactly. Um, Afsani and I have known each other a long time. We were, we were in the board of the American Red Cross together, and, uh, and we tend to have a similar point of view about certain things. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> that's right. And, um, and as, as you were talking, I was nodding my head because, uh, because I, I did agree pr pretty much with everything you said, uh, including the 100 days. Um, so one question I have um, is you have been on this tour of you know, yes. seeing many, many countries yes. and yes. visiting with a lot of different sca stakeholders with different kinds of uh, mission and objectives. Um, what have you learned, if you could give us a little bit more detail than you already yeah. did, yeah. and what is the message you're hearing from the client countries? So, Sari, the, the, uh, the first thing I picked up was that every leader, political leader in particular, is really worried about young people and their future. Yeah. In Cote d'Ivoire, uh, I heard from the prime minister that it's a 28 million population country, 400,000 young people become job eligible every year, only 15,000, one five, get a job in the formal sector. Maybe another 100,000, nobody knows how to estimate it, get a job, you know, kind of daily labor. When I was growing up in India, you used to get this thing in, in, in towns and villages and smaller cities, people sitting on the roadside in what we used to call nukkars, which is this, uh, the Indians here will understand what that means. It's the kind of a corner. And you used to wonder what the heck are these 12, 15, 20 people doing there? They were trying to get picked up for daily jobs, you know, in the port, somebody's farm, somebody's construction, someone trying to clear up their garden. I mean, that's crappy work, but it's work. And they have to earn something. 
So they would get picked up. Let's say 100,000 get picked up. The other mass of manas, 200 something thousand, don't get anything. If you have 28 million people in a country, you do the math. How long before a relatively well-governed country with technocrats in charge which has come out of COVID stronger than many other countries in Africa, how long before, given their, their, their neighborhood, where they are, how long before they become unstable? That kind of got me to the point of feeling a sense of urgency. It was the first place I went to. I met the African development back, I met Akim in the morning that day, and then met the prime minister in the afternoon, and by the evening my hair was on end, and I have a little bit of hair under the <laughs> turban, and it was on end. And, uh, and I, that came through everywhere. Young people, jobs, young people, quality of life. Quality of life is a big word. It just means all the things we are trying to do. Mm -hmm. Health, education, financial inclusion, clean air, clean water. Nothing fancy, just the stuff that they should have as a fundamental right to their lives. That was kind of the first thing I learned in great depth, everywhere. The second thing I learned was that they all care deeply about partnerships. So after all, you're going to have to partner with the government. You're going to have to partner with the private sector. They all get it. You're going to have to partner with other multilateral banks. That comes across everywhere, the need for partnership. The third thing that came across everywhere was their desperate hunger for the knowledge and the technical expertise that the bank's people can bring. And also, I think, the convening power you know, of trying to bring the right resources to their country. And that comes across in all of them. And then came across this issue of intertwined challenges. But also, I, in Kenya, I went to a, a climate innovation incubator that was funded by the World Bank and also by the EU and a number of EU countries. And they have 3,000 companies going through that incubator in the past decade or two. 60% of them run by women. I met seven, eight of them who were doing their projects there. That's what I meant about their energy and their enthusiasm is infectious. And they transform their families and the environment. So this is a climate incubator, so it's doing the right thing for climate, but also generating income and therefore helping on development. So I think it's not just that the problems are intertwined, there are also some solutions that are intertwined for relatively small amounts of money. And so that kind of picked that up. And then I finally, everywhere I went, they all kind of said, we need the private sector. We need. It's almost like now they're realizing, that, and I'll tell you what, when I was at MasterCard and I was trying to do 500 million people for financial inclusion, everybody I met distrusted me. Everybody I met said, this guy is figuring out a way to make money from the poor. And it took me years to get past that. Today, most people you meet in the development world will tell you that MasterCard was serious about financial inclusion, about sustainable impact. We've funded institutions that work on that. We care about inclusion. But it took years. And it's hard. If you don't have trust, you can't make a partnership work. So that's kind of the things I picked up that were not, not in my speech. But you see what I mean? That's the stuff. Absolutely. And I think, you know, you talked about a few things in your speech, but the point you're making about that trust is something that you have created very much in the private sector wherever you've worked. And MasterCard, obviously, there was also the foundation, uh, which did so much and continues to do so much work in Africa. But going back to your work in the private sector and what you touched on, which is sort of this digital economy. Yes. And digitization, not just as a way to make things transparent, but to bring jobs, to to bring um, the economy into a much more vibrant area. How do you see your work that you did at yeah, yeah, MasterCard yeah, 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 now yeah. translating in a little bit more detail, yeah. if you could sort of touch on that? Yeah. So I mean, the first is a, a higher level point, right. that if you run a multinational company over the last decade, what you're seeing as a challenge in multilateralism Welcome to my world as the CEO of a multinational company. I've been dealing with it for a decade. Because you go up to a country and the political ramifications of your headquarter country, MasterCard's a global company. It gets 65% of its revenue from outside of the US. 65% of its employees are outside of the US. We happen to be headquartered in the United States. And I am an American citizen, even though nobody would know that looking at me. 
right? They all think that I'm some guy who should be, oh, that's a different topic. I'll tell you about that another day. There's a different joke on that one. This guy faces it too. So the, the um, and yet I would walk into these rooms and the first thing I would receive was, you guys are an American company, and all the innuendo of that challenge between geographies and geopolitics was in my face every day. And then what's, what I used to call, I, I told my board that my single, they asked me once about three or four years into my tenure, by which time the company was doing reasonably well, you know, but we were still beginning to figure out how much we could be. And I got asked, what's the thing that keeps you up at night? What worries you the most? And I said, it is chauvinistic nationalism, which I was prescient on, unfortunately. I wish I was wrong. But that turned out to be the single biggest challenge of our world right now. And so I would tell you, I think one of the assets I bring is the ability to navigate that without losing my sense of balance. I am the US nominee, but if I get elected and I have the privilege to lead the bank, I will be the head of a multilateral institution that has to find ways to work with everybody. This, I assure you. That doesn't mean I ignore what's right or what's wrong, but that'll come with it. The second thing I learned, as an example, in financial inclusion, we in Kenya, with the Kenyan Central Bank and the Kenyan uh, commercial banks, we went to Unilever, started them. Paul Polman, who used to be the CEO at that time and is quite a voice on climate change, and is a very good personal friend, uh, said to me, I will work with you if this interests you. So what I did was, you know, all their distributors supply produce to shopkeepers. Mm -hmm. So marginal and small shopkeepers tend to be women. And they open the shop in their home for half the day when the men are gone and the kids are gone. And they operate in a cash economy because nobody gives them credit. So if they could afford to sell or they could have a demand for 12 pieces of whatever, milk powder. They only buy three because that's what they can afford when the distributor's van comes. But they've been buying those damn three pieces for 12 years, along with six pieces of that, 12 pieces of that, 24 pieces of that. If you were able to digitize those bills and then apply simple AI to understanding the likelihood of this lady's ability to generate revenue and pay back, there's no reason why you couldn't lend us some money and then have the repayment deducted from the money she pays the distributor right up front. We started doing that. 99.9% .9 repayment rates, 20% increase in sales for the women, 20% increase in Unilever sales. What's wrong with that? Win-win. And women. That's the difference. And digital. Mm -hmm. Because you were able to take these bills and translate them to digital technology and do things with the phone. That's just one example. I could give you 50 of these in different countries. I could give you examples with the impact we made on the lives of refugees who effectively spent 16 years destabilized. <coughs> David Miliband will tell you that, right? And what do they do in the 16 years? They go from one refugee camp to the other or one unstable place to the other. And it's again, it's women who get abused in this process. Because every, every uh, relief agency, in their own well-meaning way, wants that woman to register with them. Guess what? The guy who's registering you has control over you. That normally doesn't mean a good thing. So if you can take that away and replace it with a fingerprint that is accepted across the places, you just change the control dynamic. It's the same thing that India has done with its ability to distribute benefits through digitization. I, 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 you know, I could give you a hundred examples from my life that I think are relevant in this, but I have a lot to learn of what I don't know. And that to me is more important than what I know. But what you have just said, which is in your remarks, the power of the young, the fact that you have the startup communities in these yes. countries, credit worthiness of women, even if they don't have credit right now, um, the fact that you know, the digital economy can be huge in these countries is so powerful. At the same time, when you look at a lot of the stakeholders of the bank, they have 
doubt as to whether the bank will succeed to the challenges that you yourself alluded to. And they want to create other institutions, trust funds and other, you know, other subparts to tackle various different issues. Yeah. Yeah. How, what do you say to them? Right now, I'll take the money any which way it comes. <laughs> um, because it gets us to a better place than where we are today. I, I will be honest that if over time I find that that's an inefficient way to work, I am going to shout about it. Uh, but listen, when people give money, they have a right to choose who they give that money to. So we have to earn the money to come to us. What do I mean by that? Be transparent about, as I said, about the impact. I believe that if you can, you can convince people who give you money that you deserve the money because you will deliver the best results per dollar invested off that money, then as far as I'm concerned, why would they give it to somebody else? But otherwise, if there are others who can do it better, then I'm not in this game to measure the size of the World Bank. I'm in this game to make my grandchild's life better. So like, who cares about all that? We should get into this together and find a way to get it done. Along the way, make sure we don't get inefficient. Along the way, make sure we don't cross swim lanes. We're all in the same pool. And there are swim lanes for different institutions, private sector, multilaterals, and the like. We should try and do our work first before we reach into everybody else's swim lane. You know, and get past this thing. Because we've got a bigger problem ahead of us, much bigger. Talking of big problems, you talked about climate, a huge problem. Um, you were and talking to you, you know, you mentioned uh, working with Unilever, the, uh, the, a lot of the stakeholders you met. So there are a lot of conversations. The IEA talks about the trillions, and you said, you know, people like to yeah. use the number trillions when we cannot even do hundreds of millions, let alone billions. Yeah. So given that, given that we are in an environment where money is no longer at zero cost, but interest rates have gone up globally. People have, people have noticed that recently. Yes. And also the fact that, you know, a lot of private sector companies or banks or financial institutions may be more nervous about yes. the risk yes. factors in emerging markets. So how do we tackle this climate um, in, climate risk? And other issues. And by yeah. the way, like you said, there's also the climate opportunity because yeah. using yeah. Uh, not, just, not just digital but creating jobs yeah. is an opportunity in this yeah. country. So how are you, you know, what are your early thoughts? So I think, first of all, this is again to the point of view of getting private sector capital. That's the idea, yes. right? Okay. So I think that in the case, look at climate by itself. If you talk emissions for a mm -hmm. minute, um, renewable electricity, I feel like scale and technology has reached the point where while the per unit cost of renewable electricity mm -hmm. is now cheaper than the per unit cost of fossil fuel, but the upfront capex is higher and the gestations are longer and you are dealing with utilities upstream mm -hmm. who tend to desire to renegotiate every three or four years, which is kind of a little difficult way to work if you're investing money with long gestation periods. So that's why I was talking about, can we take the project off their balance sheet for a while? Can we do, can MEGA become a bigger force mm -hmm. in taking some of these guarantees and ensuring some of these risks. I mean, look at currency risk. A lot of these countries have very shallow currency markets. Uh, is there something to be done to help take some of that risk away from them? I'm not talking about taking away the risk that the private sector should legitimately bear if they want to make profits. Life's not free. If you want to bring capital, there's a risk reward. You take that decision, you're the private sector. But I am talking about taking away things that are holding them back otherwise. That, I think, is what we have to work on first. I think the second thing, clearly, is that idea of creating a roadmap in those countries, even for renewable electricity. And I'm not even, I'm mm -hmm. going to come to the other aspects of climate and emissions. That idea of a roadmap, you know, I was in India publicly. Unfortunately, my life has become public. I got COVID when I landed. And, and so I couldn't meet the PM that day, but I was able to speak to a, a number of people. And India has a laid out roadmap for where they want to go with energy. Today, they're a high consumer of coal. That's a problem. But they have a roadmap for where they're trying to go, including hydrogen, but including batteries and including natural gas as part of the transition. I 
when you lay it out that way, private sector capital is beginning to care about investing in India because not only do they have a roadmap, they also have some institutions that allow them to feel that regulatory policy will be available to them to be constructive to them. I think that's an important second thing. Now you get past energy and electricity, and then other big emitters are agriculture, mm-hmm. with methane and all the rest of it, construction materials, and of course heavy transportation. But even if you do all this, and I had this long chat with the guys who run the Potsdam uh, Foundation, and I, I kind of, again, came out a little more scared than I was when I started, because I discovered that if you don't make effort on, uh, on carbon capture and disposal and storage, then the probability of reaching net zero by 2050 kind of falls off a cliff. And then the problem is, if you take that as an excuse and stop doing all the good stuff, then this is temporary. So how does one find the right balance to not destroy the world by 2050, but also not to take the pressure off doing the right thing for the future with not just energy for electricity, but also for construction and infrastructure and agriculture and heavy transport. And I think those are still early days. That is where risk capital from development institutions, from others, have to be put so we can get to the right place. But that's the challenge I see. And I'm still, I've not even begun talking about biodiversity and soil degradation. And I mean, that's just another thing. That's the other problem. You go to the global south and you come from you know, the westernized world and you talk climate change. What we are talking mostly is emissions. And they are worried about soil and biodiversity and adaptation. And so we just got to be a little careful. There's too many buzzwords going around and too little common sense. Just everybody should take a chill pill and do this the right way. I'm Honestly, I'm telling yeah. you, there's too much buzzwords. Just calm down and worry about the real things. If you're a farmer in Kenya and you haven't had rain for four years, you're not getting two crops, you're getting one. If you're getting one crop, that dairy that you had, the cattle, on your farm, you get rid of them. Now you no longer have milk income. What do you do next? You take your daughter out of school to work on the farm. Hello. We just turned back four decades of poverty alleviation by getting the girl out of school Mm -hmm. and back on the farm. That's what we have to worry about as well, along with mitigation, along with all the buzzwords of climate. There's a lot of work to do. We just need to all sort of get onto pages that we can put our shoulders to the wheel and move. Yeah, the poor are, getting, are those who are getting the most affected I, I by... Met, I met Prime Minister yeah. Mia Motley. I barged in on her at Heathrow Airport, along with Margaret, actually. And we, we, uh, we spent, I don't know, 45 minutes with her in between flights, half an hour, 45 minutes. And look at her concern. Her concern, forget about how much money you should have or not. That's the second topic. Her concern is correct. If you're a Caribbean island and you get hit by a hurricane you will lose double digits of your GDP by the time that damn thing leaves your island. How is she going to deal with it? Just because she's a middle-income country. I think we have to think about this carefully and not get caught in these classifications and, and, and things, but care about the people at the other end of that thing. And what's practical yeah. in that and environment. And then work on it. And the fact is resources are limited. So yes, hard choices have to be made. And we have to worry about raising more resources, hence the capital adequacy framework and all that we can do with it. But also, let's tap into whatever we can with philanthropy. Let's tap into whatever we can with the private sector. I think all creativity is required at this stage because the alternative is to continue trying to do work the old way and hope for a different result. That's not going to happen. So another topic I heard in the press you were talking about recently was the famous AAA rating of the World Bank. And um, that has been in the, you know, in a lot of uh, conversations here at CGD also, a number of studies that have got done. Are you convinced, uh, based on what you know, that um, there are substantial opportunities based when you look currently? I I know you haven't had a chance to look at the details. I don't know that. Remember, I don't, I haven't been inside the bank to see it from there, but I will tell you this. If we were to lose the AAA rating, Mm -hmm. we are no longer doing what we need to do, which is to raise capital at a low enough cost that we can give it back or use it 
either in grants or concessional pricing or better pricing for the countries who cannot afford to raise it for themselves, either in terms of pricing or in terms of duration and tenor. Therefore, losing a AAA rating is a really poor idea. If you do the math, when you lose that rating, the gap between what you will then raise capital at versus what some of these countries could get becomes a non-viable place. So that I'm clear on. Now the question is, have we explored all the ways to raise more while retaining the AAA rating? And I think what I've heard from what David Malpass has said when he refers to the 50 billion, which is the 5 billion a year over a decade, I appreciate that. As I said, I learned today, the last time we raised six and a half, which has made a fair difference, mm -hmm. You know, the IDA is the single largest player in adaptation finance mm -hmm. in the world. It doesn't get the credit for that. That's a different issue. It should. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, but the Delhi Metro gets its entire energy, 80% of its energy, from solar cells in Madhya Pradesh. Guess who funded that? The World Bank. Then, guess who funded the first project back in 1970 in Brazil for pollution control? something called the World Bank. Guess who funded the first geothermal in Kenya, which by the way now Kenya gets 40% of its damn energy from geothermal and doesn't need help from us in mitigation. They should lecture us on mitigation. 93% of their energy is renewable. Guess who funded the first geothermal project there? The World Bank. But guess what gets written up? Not doing enough, can't do enough, don't know what they're doing, dumbos. That's not fair. So the, now, that doesn't mean they shouldn't be doing 10 times what we're doing. Don't get me wrong. Remember ambition. Mm -hmm. We should not fail because of lack of ambition. We should fail because of lack of execution. That's what I need. That's what I mean about where I'm going. So talking about execution and talking about you know, the tour you just had, you have visited with middle-income countries, you've visited with IDA countries. Both have different challenges. What do you see when you look at the middle-income countries? Should the bank be doing more with them, based on all the things you talked about? Yeah. And then the concessional uh, IDA countries. So I'm very clear there. that we've got to first focus on those who are the worst off. Mm -hmm. That, otherwise, why are we here? Right? So that, I think, is really important. Can't, can't not do that. But I do think that there are some regional and global challenges that cross past this definition of low-income and middle-income. Like in middle-income countries live more poor people than live in the so-called low-income countries. So are we helping poor people or are we helping classifications of countries? That's what I think we have to get to. And, and I don't know the answer to that. I can see this as being a flashpoint where everybody's going to freak out on me. And that's fine. That's my job to absorb that and still find a way to make the case for what the right thing mm -hmm. to do will be. I will start focusing on poor people and making a difference to their quality of life and then trying to find a way to get them to have jobs. That's where I'm going. I'm not going to get caught that easily before I know what I'm talking about, about low-income and middle-income countries. Excellent, as always. Huh? So we have a few more minutes for questions from the audience. We've got some questions already. If I could go to the um, audience questions. Um, we have here, Mr. Banga, if you were to become the World Bank's next president, <laughs> uh, what steps would you take to strengthen cooperation and coordination with other MDBs? Would you expect them to follow the World Bank lead, or do you see them more as equals performing vital roles in the huh. regions in which they work? And the second part is easy. I see no reason why anybody should follow anybody else. That assumes that somehow we have all the answers and other people don't, and that is... No, it's a non-starter. It has to be that we kind of get together and talk about things and learn from each other. I'm willing to bet that Akeen and you know uh, the guys in, in Ilan and the Inter-American Development Bank and the folks in other development banks around the world have all got learnings that we can pick up and steal. My general is a banker, which is not a good word banker should use. I used to always say, steal shamelessly. And I think stealing shamelessly is a great idea, provided you're not actually stealing something, you're stealing ideas that work. And, and I don't see, I, there's no pride of ownership in my world. So I am very clear that we will work with anybody who has good ideas. In fact, if anything, what I'd like to do, this is the first part of your question, I don't know enough today about what the process of interacting with the different institutions is. 
I have reached out to Kristalina, whom I've known for years. I've reached out to Akin and to Ilan, people I've known for years. I met the AIB president in China, whom again I've known for years. Um, I, I'm going to work with them. I'm going to find the right way to create the ways to share, whether it's risk sharing for the private sector, it's ideas they have in raising capital that I have not figured out. If I can help them with things we are doing, that'd be great. Wonderful. One last question. Do you see a role for evaluations at the World Bank to measure impact? Uh, I see a role for evaluations, absolutely. This institution has been around 80 something, close to 80 years. The biggest thing it's got is understanding what works, what doesn't work, but even more importantly, not just the what, but the why. And so if we can use the what and the why and enhance it through regular evaluations, transparency of that, measuring the impact, not the input, the outcome, not the incoming, then I think that's good for all of us. Uh, and I think, yeah, I'm assuming that's what you mean by evaluations Absolutely. and not the evaluations of individuals. That we should be doing anyway. Absolutely. But we should be doing it in a way that enables them to feel that taking the right kind of risk after having listened to people and considered it is something that you will get the backing of people for. I think if we freeze people, look, I, people are, we're all human beings. If you feel that everything you do is going to be evaluated by 52 other people so they can find a fault in what you've done, then guess what? The easiest thing for you to do is to not do it. Or if you do do it, make sure there's 74 signatures on the paper so that all 73 of you go to jail together. <laughs> or whatever that, that penalty is. That is a recipe for doing nothing. I am willing to bet that is part of the problem today. So you have to help me with this. I really, I'm gonna need help. Because the, I, know, I can see this. I recognize it, by the way, from my prior companies. And one of my old colleagues is sitting in the audience and she worked with me for years, she will tell you, we had the same problem in MasterCard 12 years ago. Basically, we used to call it socializing. Socializing as in, you know, group group. You know, kind of you all get into it together. So if anything goes wrong, I wasn't the guy who did it. We all did it together. That cannot be the right answer when 2030 and 2050 are within seven years and 27 years away. We have to change this. So. Ajay, this was incredibly exciting. I know we could go on. For, there were lots of other questions sure here from the audience, but absolutely, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Sure. And uh, the dynamic spirit you're bringing to the bank at this very particular time is going to be so important for its success. And we're so lucky that you are going to be the next leader, we hope, you know, obviously subject to all the processes. But um, I hope I'm, you say that after I've been there a few years. <laughs> so we'll see. Very excited. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thanks, Adrian. Thanks.